My name is Roland Murphy, I'm a watchmaker, and these are my watches. Roland, thank you very much for sitting down. I, for everybody that's watching, they might be familiar with your work, but for this discussion, I want to show Roland as the watchmaker, but also as a watch collector. One thing I love about in our discussions is just as much as you love watchmaking, you also love collecting watches. I do. And you have great fascination for it. I do. Potentially for those that are not familiar with your work, I want to establish your history as a watchmaker, your business. So could you start just for those that are not familiar, just discussing a little bit RGM and just Roland's story overall. Okay. Um, I started as a watchmaker. Um, I went to school in the, uh, in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to school at Bowman Technical School here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I went to Wostep in Neuchatel, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. When I came back, I got a job at uh, Hamilton when they were still here in Lancaster uh, in product development and eventually became the technical manager. And uh, between the vice president of product development and me, we created all of the uh, Hamilton watches. I did that for approximately five years. And then in 1992, I started RGM Watch Company and been doing that ever since. And you're very humble about it, but these, I would say I'm sitting next to the greatest watchmaker in America, and I think you've been doing, what you're doing is unparalleled in terms of what's being done in the United States. So I'm sitting next to somebody that really is doing some incredible work here in the States. Now, where do we want to begin with some of your collection? And this is just scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. We were going downstairs yeah. and we were just pulling this. random things. I mean, it was a, just a treasure hunt yeah. down there. So. Do we want to potentially start with Hamilton because that's where you, you okay. know, started your career yeah. and really uh, were getting uh, you know acclimated Absolutely. with this industry? So what do we have in front of us? Um, I pulled a few pieces out that I thought were uh, of interest to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having worked at Hamilton, but I've also had a great history um, interest in the history of watchmaking, um, especially here in America, but also in general. Mm -hmm. um, so the Hamilton here is an 18 size uh, hmm. pocket watch. It's in a, a display case. It uh, wasn't originally in a display case. I don't know, know what it was originally in, um, but uh, the dial is beautiful. What's nice about this 18-size Hamilton, why it's special to me, is it's such a low serial number. So this is a three-digit three serial number Hamilton, number 507. Hmm. So this is the 500, 507th watch Hamilton ever uh, manufactured. Uh, so this is from the uh, very uh, early 1890s. I think this one was... Uh, uh, 1896, I think. I'd have to look it up again, though, but some, somewhere around there. And where your company operates is in a small town called Mountain Joy, which is in Lancaster County. Yes. And Hamilton, founded in 1892, Lancaster uh, is as the place where they called yeah. home were producing their watches for decades. So that's why that connection, and this is still a hotbed for watchmaking in a way. You have Lilith's, which is close by, right? And then you have... Yes, we, we have the Watch Tech Technicum, the school up there mm -hmm. that Rolex runs. Uh, we have the, uh, in, in Columbia, we have the NAWCC, the National mm -hmm. Association of Watch and Clock Collectors. Um, you know, we, we're here still, so there, there's still a lot going on in the area. So that's part of your connection. So another Hamilton in front of you here, this is now getting into their military field style watches, but this yes. also plays a signif uh, significant role in your the story with the brand and really what the brand now is known as for this field yes. collection. Yes, this, this is the model. Uh, this is one of the, uh, like one of those general service models that mm -hmm. Hamilton made. And this was the uh, model that we used when I worked at Hamilton, uh, was the inspiration for the first khaki automatic watch. <laughs> uh, and if you look at the first khaki automatic that, that was ever done, it looks very similar to this watch. Uh, even the shape of the case, uh, the uh, general layout of the dial. Uh, so, but this is the original. So uh, this is a uh, this is a watch that has a very a deep history, very collectible piece uh, nowadays. If you if you look online. So, and how did that come to be when you were going through and trying to figure out? Because in product development, it's you're going through this old documentation, you're going through old watch designs. Like, how did that process look? And you're here based in the United States at the time. You were not over in Switzerland because yeah. at that point, Hamilton still had operation offices, corporate offices here in Lancaster. Yeah, what, what we were doing in Lancaster at the time in the 80s is we were doing a product development mm -hmm. uh, in the assembly. So uh, we would look into uh, the history of Hamilton and the watches, and, and that's kind of how we would find the inspiration. Of course, you know, uh, certainly, they have all those retro models that came out in the 80s, like, mm -hmm. the, like the, the Bolton and the Wilshire and, yes. and the, 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 the Ventura and, mm -hmm. and others. So 
uh, which are still some of those are, are part of yeah, the key pillars line. still yes absolutely uh, st still important models so um, I can see the roots of uh, things in, in the line there today of, of things that, that we started and of course a lot of that was inspired by things that were done you know back as far as the you know the 40s um, up into the 60s and early 70s. So where do we want to transition next? I mean, I feel like I want to show off maybe some of your pieces. You only have a few of your pieces here, but do you want to start with an 801? Because that was so yes. important in your history as a watchmaker. And for those that are not familiar, this was your own first movement that you created. Well, the Hamiltons I have here, mm -hmm. I mean, not the Hamiltons, the RGMs I have here is I have, um, first let's start with an early watch, sure, which, which is uh, the jumping hour. This is the 102J. Um, this is an 18 karat gold watch. Um, with a engine turn dial, blued steel hands, and the jumping hour function manual wind watch. So uh, this was really the second model we developed that was a completely different model. The first model, RGM, was the 101M and the 101, which were very similar. Mm -hmm. um, but this was, uh, I wanted to get into something uh, shaped, and I wanted, to, and I always like complications and functions. So. Uh, it's a clean, simple looking watch, but it has the jumping hour function. So this is probably 1993 um, is when uh, we first developed this model and it was sold for, for a number of years. It's, uh, it's been out of production a long time. And you did the early work on that. I mean, a full assembly yep. was you, Rose yep. engine work was you. So that was all early, early uh, mm -hmm. RGM. And then we get into the uh, much later, Mm -hmm. um, it was the, uh, in 2007 is when we came out with the 801 movement. So How long was production again on the 801? It was well, quite we a while. Well, we were, it was about 2000 to 2007 mm -hmm. was the development period before, because, you know, it's, it's a big jump from um, servicing, repairing, and restoring to actually manufacturing a, a, a movement. So, um, you know, and not being in the center of, of, of that that's being done here today, you know, it, it was a big learning curve. but. Uh, and it, the, the watches we make today, the movements we make today, uh, you know, we've improved them over the years. So mm -hmm. we've learned a lot since 2007 and our watches, our movements are, are much nicer than even the first one. And those are all being assembled in the location that we're at here. Manufactured and assembled. Yes, Manufactured and assembled. Exactly. Yeah. So this is the uh, Corps of Engineer model. We have several 801 models. So this is what we call the 801 COE. Mm -hmm. It's inspired by the uh, World War I Corps of Engineer uh, pocket watches mm -hmm. and I have one of those inspirations uh, right here this is an original uh, Corps of Engineer pocket watch and mm -hmm. you can see the similarities uh, are uh, great so that's mm -hmm. really the inspiration but we wanted something we could wear on the wrist and this also has a real fired glass enamel dial mm -hmm. just like the original now we make engine turn dials here and do that but we don't do enamel dials so I had to find someone who could do it because I, I don't like faux things so I didn't want a white dial that looked like an, a, an enamel dial. Mm -hmm. It had to be a real enamel dial. So uh, uh, the, the quality of that is uh, really really shows through. So this is a, a, a great example of our movement, how the watchmaking past has brought those things forward. And the Corps of Engineer look, many people will recognize it. Um, Vacheron made a number of them, but Narden mm -hmm. and Zenith, but also uh, Hamilton made the first Corps of Engineer pocket watches uh, in World War One. Mm -hmm. Speaking of pocket watches, where, I mean, where do you actually want to go next? I mean, this is your collection. What do you think is important to well, touch on? Well, why don't we stay in Lancaster here for a moment? Let's do it. Yeah, I see some and things on here I've never seen before. So this, this is, very is a uh, Dudley Masonic watch. So. Okay. The uh, bridges on the movement are in the shape of the Masonic symbols. Hmm. So we have like the plumb bob and the trowel. Uh, we have the level, the compass. Um, you know, all of these. Uh, we have the Bible in engraved on the uh, on the bridge here. The model two and three had an applied one. This is the model one. This is the most collectible version. Hmm. Uh, so this uh, was made uh, in Lancaster. Uh, my, all Model 1s were made in Lancaster. Some of the other models, when the company went out of business, some of them were assembled in other places to finish some of them up. But Model 1s were all done entirely here in Lancaster. Uh, very collectible watch, very interesting. So there's and, a short lifespan too for this company. Yeah, it was it about five years, five years yeah, in, the, in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And so I like anything associated with watchmaking um, in Lancaster County especially. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's not... I don't just limit myself to collecting watches from here, but I particularly have a fondness for watches 
uh, from this area. And there were a number of companies pre-Hamilton mm -hmm. and then just a few after, uh, after Hamilton had started, this being one of them. So where do you want to uh, shift to next? Well, why don't we uh, look at a few Swiss watches here that I it. find interesting. Let's look at the Zenith 135 and the Pazoo hmm. um, 260 because the, the reason for that is both of these movements, um, the Zenith 135 and the Pazoo 260, were both used in chronometer competitions mm -hmm. uh, in Switzerland. So these were basically designed for that purpose. The 260s weren't really... Uh, cased in the wristwatches, although some people afterwards, there, you'll find a few cased ones, um, but it wasn't really intended for that, just for competitions. The 135 was, was designed for this competition, but Zenith also, uh, unlike the Pazoo, they also cased them and, and sold them. So you can find some original models that were cased, this being a very fine, fine example of that. Stunning. So. Um, very interesting movement. You can look into the history of the 135 or the, or the Pazoo 260. Uh, it's, it's quite an interesting story there. Do you recall the general accuracy range that they were trying to achieve at this point at in time? At the time, I'm, I'm not sure what, the, like this, this, you could probably find a certificate mm -hmm. in Switzerland for what this movement actually did. Um, but I don't know what the winning movements were at that time, but we could certainly find that out. We could actually get the certificate for this very movement mm -hmm. if we wanted to. Very cool. Yeah, because it's all documented. It, exactly. Through the chronometer. Exactly. Yeah. So we would have a uh, take the number off this, and uh, we could probably uh, find <laughs> find that, uh, or at least apply to have it sent to us. So we have a couple more out there eccentric watches. We have one in a box, one over here. Where do you want mm -hmm. to start first? Well, why don't we why don't we look at the La Coltra here? This okay. is uh, the Quartermaster. It's in the original box. It's, it's in very bad condition. <laughs> uh, the original certificate is here with the watch. Um, I bought this watch because I like watches that are unusual. This watch was only made for the U.S. market. It's a true 24-hour timepiece. So we have the 24-hour uh, uh, dial one rotation a day. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to really find other La Culture models like that. Um, this uh, particular one, I believe, was available, this model, and with a black dial or, or this uh, silver dial. Uh, so really rare, only made for the U.S. market. And I believe there was only like one, one run, and that was, that was it. So it's a, a pretty scarce piece. So I like to collect things that are unusual. And of course, you know, if they're scarce or rare, that, that's even better. So. Uh, that's why I have that as part of my collection. Very cool. And then I have a couple interesting stories here. One is the um, hmm. the Omega Flight Master. Um, this is a, a, a really nice example and really, really good condition. I had this watch since the 1980s. And this watch I got uh, as a very young watchmaker and um, fixed it up and have kept it all these years. There's always those watches that you uh, they come and go. You know, there's the ones that you wish you would have kept, and um, you know, this is one that if I would have sold it, I, I, I would have. Uh, you know, there's others that I, I wish I would have kept, but this one, fortunately, I held on to. Um, and I was telling you uh, previously that, you know, what was nice about back in the '80s is you could buy watches like this. They were very obtainable. At, you know, for somebody who was just starting out as a watchmaker, and nowadays you, they're really not affordable yeah. for someone. Um, that is uh, just starting out. So that's, that's a little bit sad because, you know, I think I had the ability to enjoy some really, uh, really special pieces back then being into watches early. Yeah, you know and you mean? said $300 for that yes. watch, and I'm like, yeah. oh my goodness, I can't, yeah. like, what, what has happened? <laughs> but it was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, the other interesting piece I have here that has a story Yes. Uh, is this uh, Vacheron Constantine uh, Minute Repeater, an 18 karat gold case. Stunning. It has the addition of a little... A clasp up here that's been soldered to the bow. Yeah, what's going on with that? Can you tell us? About yeah, that? this story with this watch was this watch was sent to me uh, a few years back, um, pre-COVID, so I'm going to say six or seven years, mm -hmm. uh, by an, an older lady in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and she wanted to have this watch fixed. It was her father's watch, and she used to wear this watch on a chain around her neck. So she said she would jog around Philadelphia a wearing repeater. this watch with this repeater around it, but she didn't know it was a repeater. Hmm. She never knew that it was a, a, a repeater. But fixing these kind of watches can be expensive, complicated of watches. Course. So um, she really wasn't in a position to, to fix it. Mm -hmm. So I, 
I asked her if she had a family member or somebody that might enjoy this watch because it was quite valuable and, and, and quite complicated. We wanted to see it ended up in the right hands. But unfortunately, she didn't have any children and her husband had passed away and she didn't have any living family. So really, we didn't, you know, so my first thought is what's going to, you know, one day what's going to happen to this? So mm -hmm. um, uh, I, since she couldn't pay to, to fix it, I offered to buy the watch from her, and that's really what uh, what happened. So I purchased the watch from her. Uh, I gave her a fair price for it, and then uh, you fully restored uh, it. That's I a have part of what you do. It, it is yeah. right. So this one, I actually uh, serviced it, <laughs> and uh, and repaired it, got it working again. So why don't we make it strike? Oh, please, here. and let's hold see. it closer to the mic yeah. so we can hear. It. So let's let's hold it up to your uh, okay. mic there. Yeah, so like right there. Let's yeah, get it going here. Yeah, I think that I think that's the first time in uh, probably over a year that I've uh, I've had this watch strike. <laughs> so um, it's uh, usually in a display case in the in the vault. But really, really nice watch, uh, beautiful piece, and has a great story. And I'm I'm glad we could put it in order and and have it. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, where we can actually see it. I can't believe uh, she was and, walk, and, and, just running around with that. Yeah, her I necklace. just had to imagine her running around, you know, the uh, city wearing this watch flopping around her neck. But uh, and you, the fact that you got it back and it was the move, I mean, it just goes to show how resilient these things are, right? Yeah. Even a, a repeater being yeah. able to withstand that and uh, yeah. still sound great. Yeah. Say. It, it wasn't in bad condition. It was really just all dried up and, and hardened grease and oil and mm -hmm. things like that. And then there's one more piece that kind of yes, has... Yes, please. Uh, one on your wrist. And uh, like I said, this is a small sampling of my collection, but this is, uh, some of these have some stories. So this, this watch here has a story because it kind of ties um, different uh, parts of my watch career together uh, and family too. So um, this watch was a watch that I had to put together for my father. When I first started RGM, the Model 101 and 101M were the first models. Um, were only in 18 karat gold cases, so that they were expensive, mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't really afford to give those things away, especially for starting out. So what I did was I I, I took a, a a Hamilton steel case, and I put in it our, um, our RGM uh, dial and hands and uh, movement, and I put this together for my father. Hmm. And there's only two or three watches like this out there that we had put together for uh, a few family members. And uh, actually one of them I saw pictures of recently. Somebody sent me a picture, someone bought one and didn't know what the story was with the watch. So I actually told him. But, so this piece, uh, my uh, late father, um, you know, I can remember him wearing this watch uh, quite, quite often. It ties together Hamilton, because I used to work there in Proactive Valor, ties together the beginning of, of RGM being, being the, the first one. So uh, it has an interesting story and it's, it has a place in my collection <laughs> uh, and is, uh, is down there proudly with, uh, with, uh, with my other watches. Did your dad have a connection to watches at all? And how did this all? Uh, through, through me, I mean, he grew to uh, love watches and clocks. Mm -hmm. He actually then learned to repair clocks. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, I had given him several watches. I have them mm -hmm. all in the vault down there. Um, so he has uh, early RGMs. He has some, when I worked at Hamilton, he has some other ones that we liked, Speedmaster, Submariner. Uh, Ulysses Narden, uh, chronometer, other 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 pieces. So uh, all uh, pieces that I would never sell, obviously, because mm -hmm. because of the tie, the family tie there. But so so this has an interesting story too. So this is a small sampling of the uh, the watches I have. Not not necessarily the most valuable pieces, mm -hmm. but pieces that have interesting uh, stories. Yeah, and that's what we're looking for. And uh, I think. For those that are watching, if we could probably do a whole other episode, so if enough people enjoy it, we might come back yeah, again and we can... There's so many more watches. Yes. <laughs> always is. But Roland, thank you so much for the time. Yes. Always a pleasure, a pleasure to speak with you. Thank Until you, next time. Thank Pre you. Appreciate you coming. See you, everybody. Thank you.